Coming up next, three daily disciplines to help you start off the year right and I'm going to teach you on what you need to be overlooking. We'll take your calls and some Momentum Monday stories. It all starts right now. I am coming to you live from Ramsey Studios in Nashville, and you are joining a conversation about who you are, what you were created to do, where you want to do it, and how you can get there. So excited to have you aboard with us. I am rested and ready to go, Joe. I am fired up today. You know, I was just talking to my colleague, Dr. John Deloney, in the hallway here outside of the studio. We ran into each other moments before the show started, which, by the way, Joe, is why I was a little late getting in the chair. I, I, lo I looked up. It was about 30 seconds to go time, and, and I'm sliding in the chair, and that always makes Joe, the producer, and Nathan, the director, a little nervous. Uh, but uh, ran into John Deloney in the hallway outside the studio. And we were just talking for a moment about how nice it is to have that downtime. And, and I hope that, uh, that you practice that this year. You know, whatever that needs to look like for you, I'm just going to leave it there. That downtime is wonderful and it should not be looked at. I'm talking like where you're not thinking, you're not striving, you're not doing, you are just resting, recreating yourself. And so I've had a bunch of that, and and I have missed you folks, and I'm excited to get back to it. Um, and we're going to have some fun today. So let's get right to it. Great article from Yahoo. Uh, and, and just a great reminder that this isn't something you should do at the start of the year. This is something you should do on a daily basis. But I think it's important to share with you because I think it will help you get a good start. And uh, so three basic things. So first is the morning. Now, they say you need a morning mantra, and I like that. I, I, I love words. I love practices, traditions, rhythms. I like all that. And so the morning mantra. Now, basically what they're saying is, is that uh, before you dive into the day, the things, the distractions, whether that be social media or your email or, or your to-do list, say something to yourself that sets your day. Say something. Hey, I feel great when I do this. Or I'm so grateful for this. Uh, I, I will tell you that I do this, and, and I do this in, in prayer. But every morning, the first thing I do, I get up, throw the glasses on. I got the very cushy Restoration Hardware robe. I'm not going not gonna to be ashamed of that. It's fantastic. I roll out, get the cup of coffee, Joe head into my area where I sit in the house and no one's up, not even the dogs. And the first thing I do after that initial two sips of coffee is I pray. And the first part of my prayer is all the things I'm thankful for. And I have a list and I look at it so that I remind myself what I have to be grateful for. And then I actually show my gratitude. In prayer, and I thank God for the list of things. Now, you can do that however you want to do it, but that's the idea. What do you want to call it? A mantra, a prayer, but it's setting your mind and the feelings come with that. So, so your mind and heart come together right out of the gate. Number two, they talk about an afternoon affirmation. I love this. I love alliteration. So I love anything alliteration. I get excited about it. And so the afternoon affirmation is good. It's a time to kind of step away from the grind. Could be 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Could be 4. Whatever it is it needs to be for you. Could be 5 minutes. Could be 15 minutes. Could be a 20-minute walk. I know a lot of high-level producers who take walks right in the middle of their afternoon. It's scheduled in the midst of meetings, desk time, whatever. And they have a time where they step away. And this afternoon affirmation is a way to, again, reinforce either some gratitude, things that you believe about yourself, things that you're wanting to do, and it keeps the main things the main thing. Really, really love it. And finally, evening dreaming. And I think this is wonderful. Uh, John Maxwell, who I used to work for for years, a legendary uh, leadership guru and personal and growth guru, has this practice of every night before bed, you reflect on your day. And then you look forward, you reflect on the good, and you think about the next. This idea of dreaming at night before you fall asleep so that you're thinking about these things that you long for. Uh, really great practices 
and you will be surprised at how quickly you see positive change in your life. When you have that mindset and you are thinking and feeling on purpose. See, we think and feel things all day long that come at us and we are reactive. But this is the idea of being proactive. Life has got plenty for us to react to. It is the discipline of being proactive that is the game changer. Let's get your mind and heart aligned. Be thinking and feeling the same things on purpose. And I love the morning mantra, the afternoon affirmation, and the evening dreaming. Really good stuff from Yahoo there. 844-747-2577 is the phone number. It is a free phone number. 844-747-2577. Here's what we do on the Ken Coleman Show. If you're new, we talk about what you were created to do. We talk about purpose. Great little movie out that I'm going to review this week. Madison and Joe, you need to remind me to do this. Uh, one of the things I want to do this week, I want to review for folks the movie Soul. Uh, my family and I watched it the first night it came out from Pixar. I believe it was Pixar. And uh, fabulous little movie. I've already had a couple of people say, well, Ken, what did you think about it? Well, you know, I didn't watch it to critique it. Uh, that was a wonderful piece of art. It warmed my heart. I enjoyed it. I'll also admit that I dozed off for a few minutes, but that's just because of the angle of which I was sitting. Uh, but <laughs> but it's a great little movie, and I'm going to review it because there's some really good stuff in there. Uh, and so as the movie talks about spark, you're, you know, I call it the juice. But you know, it really reaffirmed that really if you ask the question, well, how do I figure out my purpose? You could say that, well, your purpose is to be who you were created to be in your relationships and then in your creative expression, your work. That's really what I think work is, a creative expression. I believe that you were created to fill a unique role in your relationships and in your work. In other words, you've got to be this to the people that you do life with and all those different variant forms of your relationships. And then you must do what you were created to do. The world needs what you can offer. Somebody else needs you. So really, if we play this out, and I say this every day, that you were created to fill a unique role, you were needed, you must do it. You need to be who you were created to be because somebody out there needs you, then that's a relational component too. So we never get away from the relationship connection to work. And so I want to help you figure out what you were created to do and then come up with the path. And we've got a clear path for you, seven stages, like a mountain climb. So that's why we're here, 844-747-2577. Let's get to it. Wixom, Michigan is where we're going to start off. Mason is joining us there. Mason, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Happy New Year, uh, Mr. Coleman. Happy New Year, Mason. How can I help? Um, I'm looking to help. I'm looking for some help finding my purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried teaching you know, many, many years ago, about 15 years ago, it wasn't the right path. Uh, so I've been working minimum wage jobs, trying to figure out where to go. And uh, I'm, I'm looking for some assistance. Okay. All right. Um, I'd love to know what are some of the clues, if necessary, from teaching. You tried it 15 years ago. Why did you get out of it? Um, basically it just wasn't a good fit for my personality. Um, I'm kind of, I kind of like being more in the background than the, in the foreground and let's face it, teaching, you got to be in the foreground. Mm -hmm. Now, what was the part of teaching that you did love other than being in front of the kids and kind of in front? Was there, or I should ask, is there anything you enjoyed about it? Um, I really liked explaining, um, how to do math cause I was a high school math teacher. Mm hmm is that um, why you got into it? Because you've always enjoyed math and you've enjoyed kind of problem solving and the idea of teaching others to problem solve. Is that what led? Is that what led you to teaching? Well, what led me to teaching was is I worked as I helped um, my group when I was in high school, to, and I tr I tutored them while I was in uh, yeah. in class with them. And, and did that give you the juice? That that seemed like it would be the good way to go. No, I didn't but ask you then, that. I asked you, when you were a student and you were helping your fellow students, uh, did it give you the juice? Did you enjoy that instruction, that tutoring? Yes, yes, I did. Okay. Uh, and so we need to look into that. We need to go, okay, wait a second. I love the instruction. I don't like this part of the traditional teaching model. 
Okay, which you've kind of said is it it's being up in front of the students and kind of the public presentation part. But when you got one on one with the kids, you did like that. Yes. Okay. You see how that's different. So that so what we're taking is we're talking is we want to pull the performance piece out of instruction. Okay. Is that making sense so far? Mm -hmm. If we strip that out, it's almost like you got to look at it and go, what did I love? What did I not love? What drained mm -hmm. me? What gave me the juice? And it feels like the only thing that drained you, and tell me if there's something else that we're missing, but what really drained you was just the public performance, that public speaking piece. You're not comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Any, anything else? Um, and I just couldn't handle the paperwork too. <laughs> all right. That's good to know. Okay, so that's all of that. And by the way, a lot of teachers can't handle that. See, people who are instructors, the only thing they want to do is research the topic, research methods, get creative with methods, and then instruct. They don't want to do all that paperwork. It's not. It's just, ugh. All right? So we don't want to read too much into that, but that just is another guideline. Um, and, and, and so I, I think there's enough here to put you to the test. What would you try tomorrow, Mason? If you knew you couldn't fail, knowing what we just talked about, this idea that the idea of you problem solving, helping others with problem solving, the one to one relationship, connection, instruction, what would you do tomorrow? Don't worry about job title. What would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? Hmm. Um, Describe the work. Don't worry about the title. Just say, it. what would you do? I would probably teach people just train I, them on how to do their job better i love that that is beautiful because folks i want you to pay attention here's mason who called into the show and he's going ken i have no idea what i want to do with my life and so we go back and we look at some of the clues where he did love it and and then when i put him to the test mason you did what very few people can do when i put you on the spot like that when i say don't get into the details you just said i want to teach i want to train and I think at your heart, you are, an you are an instructor trainer. I think that's the unique role that you were put on the planet to fill. Do you agree with that? you resonate with that idea? Yes. Yeah. So now we go, where in the marketplace, Mason? Where are all the places? Here's another way of saying it. What are all the ways, occupationally, that you can train others? Well, my goodness, it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. I mean... That's every industry in the United States. People have trainers. Could be HR. Could be healthcare training. Could be technology training. Uh, could be corporate training where you're, you know, training processes and operations. You know, it, it, it's pretty endless. So that gets to be exciting. What I don't want that to be is intimidating. <laughs> okay. So now let's have some fun with the heart questions. All right. We know you love... Uh, the work, the passion. We talk about passion, identifying passion as work we love to do. You like learning, true or false? True. You love problem solving, true or false? True. You love connecting with people, true or false? Uh oh, that's indifferent on that. <laughs> In indifferent on that. Let me say a different way. You love connecting with a person for the purposes of teaching, and instructing them. Yes. That's what I mean. The one to one. Not one to right. many. That's what I mean. Right. All right, good. So we're still rolling. Okay, these are mm -hmm. all things on your passion list. Work you love to do. All those are forms of work. Are you still tracking with me on that? Yes, I am. Okay, great. So let's talk about the people. So let's talk about mission, the results you want to create. This is what's going to give you the clarity on where in the marketplace, the marketplace match. What are the problems you most want to solve? Who are the people you most want to help? What are the solutions you most want to provide? Give me some answers. Go. Basically, what I'm trying to do is I want to make sure people are doing what they're what they're supposed to be doing the right way. Okay. So the problem you so the so let's go into the problem there. So you're a guy who's driven. You've got a driver there. Results that matter most. This is mission, folks. If you're following along. Talent's what he does best, passion's what he loves to do, and mission are the results he wants to create. So the work creates a result. What are the results that fire Mason up? And and Mason, what I'm hearing is efficiencies, productivities, that's, that's what gives you the juice. When you're training somebody to do it the most effective, most efficient way possible, the most excellent way possible, you get fired up. Right. Okay, so let's be a little bit more specific. Let's go three levels, three levels deeper. What area of results 
what, what, what those, those results, the efficiencies, the excellencies, where is there an industry? Is there a specific uh, type of result that you want to produce there that jumps out at you? Not, nothing specific um, right now because – yeah, but is it is it is it of an operate? So let me let me help you with this. Is it is it people things? Oh, excuse me. Is it is it people results? Is it process results? Process results, probably. That's what I thought. So now we're going. Okay, I need to be involved in processes. If I'm training mm-hmm. people to do processes better, or I'm training people to do certain things in an area of process, so that is going to be your back end type stuff. Okay, so whether that be mm-hmm. in technology, healthcare, just good old fashioned small business, big business, it doesn't matter. You need to be looking in areas that are systems and operations. Operations and systems work, whether you know, and that's where you're you're that guy. You're coming in, you're analyzing and training, or maybe you're just training. But that's the kind of work you're gonna get really excited about. So your mm-hmm. homework assignment, Mason, is to do some research. Okay. In my area of Wixom, Michigan, or if you're available to move anywhere in the country, you begin to say, okay, what are the type of process work? Do I want to be a systems analyst? Do I want to be in operations? Do I want to be a trainer? Do I want to train people? And what are areas of specialization and training? And as you begin to look into this, this stuff is going to become very, very clear to you. Make sense? Yes. So you know what you want to do. You want to use what you do best, that problem solving, that uh, communicating, the training, the instructing, to do that work to produce efficiency and excellence. That's what drives you. Yes. And you lay your head down on the pillow at night going, this was a good day. I helped some people do their work really, really well. And I'm a part of a big picture that's running really smooth now. And that's it, my man. That's what you need to be doing. And aside, And by the way, that means there's 7, 8, 10, 12, 15 careers there. <laughs> cool. It's exciting, isn't it? It's why you're laughing. Yeah. Tell people yeah. why you're laughing. It's it's a relief to finally know where I'm supposed to go. Yeah. There it is. And that's why we do it. Hey, Mason, go, my man. You got work to do. All right, Chelsea's up next in San Antonio, Texas. Chelsea, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hi, Ken. Thanks so much for taking my call. You bet. What's going on, Chelsea? Um, I am a clinical mental health counseling major in graduate school Mm -hmm. with an undergrad in psychology. However, my background is military service and IT work. So my question is, now that my dream internship with Veterans Affairs has become available, how do I make myself stand out when I don't really have any previous experience in the mental health field? Okay. Well, um, I would not, the first thing we need to do is is take that away. Because really the question should be, Ken, what do I do to stand out? I want you to remove the back part of that sentence, even though I don't have any experience. Because as an intern, okay. I don't know how much experience they're looking for. Have they told you? Mm, they told me that my military experience doesn't help. No, I didn't ask that. <laughs> they didn't really give me much else. <laughs> okay, so they basically said your military experience is, doesn't, isn't a benefit to you, but it, it doesn't hurt you either. Yeah. Okay, here's my point. Go back and we start with, do how much experience do I need? Are they clear on that? Have they said in any of the listing uh, for the internship, have they said you need this experience? If you don't have it, go pound sand. Don't bother us. <laughs> um, they gave parameters as to like what part of our program we're supposed to be in, but that's about it. Okay, so the answer, I'm, I'm, that was a confusing answer to me. I'm simple. Did they tell you? <laughs> that there were certain experience you must have to apply for an internship? No. Okay, then. So it doesn't sound like to me that you need experience. It's an internship, right? Mm-hmm. Now, there's a reason why I'm getting you here. You, you're you asking the wrong question about experience. It's not about experience. It's what do I need to do to stand out. So here's what we do. This is for the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, they have a yeah. checklist of all the <laughs> things that you need to submit to them for Uh, the internship, correct? Yes. All right. Uh, Is there anything in there on recommendations, things from congressmen, anything like that? Yep, two uh, letters of recommendation. Okay. Did they say two and only two, or could you really blow them away with seven awesome ones? Mm, They kind of 
they said two and only two. There, it's okay. You see where I'm going with this? So how do you stand yeah. out? If they've got a boilerplate, in other words, they've got a menu, they're going, here's what we need. We need two letters. We need this. We need this. We need this. So how do you stand out above and beyond that? Okay. So this is where you you give them everything they ask for. So if they ask for two letters, get two great letters. Okay. And then mm -hmm. what you want to do is you want to dig a little bit and find out to the best of your ability, if you know anybody that knows somebody in the Department of Veterans Affairs who is actually going to be making decisions in that internship. Because everybody else is going to do what you do. They're all going to do the same menu, and they're just going to hope for it. What you're going to do is use the proximity principle, and I'm going to give you a copy of my book, okay, which is all oh, about connections, <laughs> and I want you to read it, okay? But I'm going to tell you specifically what I want you to do. I want you uh, talking to... Uh, everybody you know, first level. So first level means friends, family, and you say, do you know anybody who works in the Department of Veterans Affairs? We start there, okay? Then okay. when you start working for that congressional recommendation, I would, when you ask for the letter, say, hey, can you find out or can you tell me, somebody in the congressman's office, can they tell you who is actually making the decision? Is there somebody that's above... Of uh, this, uh, somebody that's, uh, well, there is somebody, but who is it? Then you need to do your mm -hmm. own research. Is there anything listed online? Call up the Department of Veterans Affairs and say, hey, who's in charge of the internship program? Get a name. Hang up the phone, okay. wait a day, call back and go, hey, uh, is so and so in? And if they put you to voicemail, leave a great voicemail. Okay. Then I want you to write a handwritten note. Okay. And write it to that person. And tell them why you want to do it. Now, I also want you to download my resume guide at KenColeman.com. It's free. And I want you to review that. And it tells you exactly how I want people to fill out a resume. But I want you to do it in this handwritten note. Just short and sweet. Also, try to get an email. Do the same note via email. And the voicemail, leave a 30-second, hey, here's why I want to be here. And follow the resume guide as to what you've done, why you want to be there, and write your notes, write the email, leave the message that way. That's going to make you stand out. But what you've got to do is make extra touch points that everybody else won't. Everybody else is just going to fill out the menu items and send it. What you're going to do is work really hard to find a name. Who's in charge? Okay. And you're going to reach out to them on a personal level and let them know how passionate you are and why this is your dream internship now i'm going to put you to the test okay it's just you and me forget everybody else that's listening okay okay <laughs> why is it your dream internship the veterans affairs why is this your dream internship um i've just always really wanted to work with the veteran community why um i feel like they they don't get the right kind of help most of the time and i want to be part of that part of that change a lot of veterans see that going to the va as like kind of a nightmare experience and I know why I does can it matter make that better. Why does it matter enough for you to try to make veterans lives better? Keep going deeper into your heart. You're doing great by the way. I want to go another level deeper. Why does this matter to you? Why do you want to make their experience better? They're my friends and family. Yeah. But it's deeper than that too. What do you see in your friends and family that are veterans that make you want to fight for other veterans? Mm, I don't know how to answer that. I know, but that's why I'm pushing you on it, because you need to. There's one level deeper. You're really close. This is more than just the fact that you've got friends and family members that are veterans. Why do you think our veterans, America's veterans, deserve the best care? I mean, they're willing to die for everyone here and what does that mean to you that means i need to give back bingo you see where i'm taking you mm -hmm. the way you stand out is by sharing your deep 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 feelings about the men and women who are our veterans you've got to tell them why why do i why is this the dream because i've seen my friends and family put their lives on the line I've grown up in a military family and I knew what the risk was and I've seen other 
friends, and I think about the men and women who've served our country and died for my freedom. It's the least I can do to try to make their lives. You see what I'm saying? You've got to, this is where we get into standing out, is by sharing your deep abiding love of the work and for the results. Passion and mission. It's got to come out of you. Make sense? Yes. Thank you. You're ready to roll, aren't you? I <laughs> am. All right. Awesome stuff. Thank you for the call. You know what to do. All right. Coming up next. Oh, this is going to be fun. We have some great stories from you, the listeners, the viewers. We call it Momentum Monday and what you need to overlook. Don't move. We're coming right back. Our world is changing, but so are we. Now, we see a smile through someone's eyes. We conquer our struggles and cherish each moment. Because we are shielded through faith and assured by hope. And greatest of all, we love. The world is different, but so are we. Welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show, coming to you live from our Ramsey Studios in Nashville. Thrilled to have you with us. 844-747-2577. 844-747-2577 is the phone number. Uh, on our Monday shows, we love to share uh, what we call just little momentum stories. We've told you to email us. Ask at KenColeman.com is the email address to the show, by the way. If you have any questions or, uh, or anything you want to share, uh, that's one way to do that. And we said, hey, we want to share little stories of momentum. Doesn't have to be huge. Doesn't have to be stepping into the dream job. We've got the dream screen for that. If that's you and you're about ready to step into the dream, we'd love for you to call and share your story with others. And at the end, you do your dream scream. You yell, I'm living the dream. And we cheer you on and celebrate you because we know it encourages and inspires others. Uh, but first, we've got some stories. Joe, let's get to them. It's time for Momentum Monday. Oh, Kayla started into the dream job today. It was my first day working as an admin assistant uh, at a laboratory and aquarium. I started listening to your show recently, and uh, I started really understanding the proximity principle, which says to do what I want to do, I've got to be around people who are doing it and in places where it's happening. I love when they actually write the full principle out in the email. I mean, that, that now they know they've got it. And uh, so uh, I started doing that, and uh, it has been so amazing. I got to meet... Uh, uh, Dr. Sylvia Earle uh, are some specimens that one of my heroes collected in the 1960s. Uh, she's one of my idols uh, and getting to work in the area um, that she worked in as an admin assistant. So she's not in the dream job, but she's starting towards the dream job there. And that is, in fact, the proximity principle, getting in there. And she got in, entry-level admin assistant. Now she's there, and she's literally looking at these specimens of one of her idols and getting to see them. That's how it works, Kayla. Way to go. Uh, Adam gets a new job. He says, uh, hey, Ken, uh, started feeling like I needed to move to Nashville uh, six months ago, and around that time I started listening to your program, and I knew then that I had to try. Uh, so I used the proximity principle. I reached out to people that I know worked in my – field in Nashville uh, and applied where they had some connections using your template and uh, got several calls. And now I'm heading that way, moving in March. Way to go, Adam. And then finally, Eric says, hey, uh, Ken, just want to let you know that a year ago I graduated with my MBA. Going into that program, I didn't know what my calling and passion was, had no career direction. I just wanted out of my previous job and industry. As the two-year program went on, I discovered your show. It felt like you were talking directly to me. So I started doing what you tell callers to do. And I got to tell you, it works. I've been in a job now for a large corporate bank, and I am enjoying it every day. The environment, the culture is great, and I see a great future. So... Uh, great stuff. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you, Adam, for the updates. People are making progress. That could be you. Why isn't that you? 
because you're not doing what you need to do. That's why we do the program. Call me. Listen in as I talk to other callers and, and, and go, okay, how do I apply that? How do I apply that? Because, folks, the stuff that I teach day in and day out, the seven stages, get clear, get qualified, get connected, get started, get promoted, get the dream job, give yourself away. That's the climb. Those are the seven stages. They come from here and here through my journey. If I can start going towards broadcasting at 33, you can start today. The stuff I teach works, not because I'm smarter than anybody else, because I'm not. The stuff that I teach works, not because I just fell off of a rock one day and said, huh, let's try this. By happenstance, it started to make sense. No. The stuff that I teach works because I've lived it, and I've seen other successful men and women live it, and it'll work for you. But you've got to believe that there is a unique role for you to fill. Once you get that belief and then you begin to figure out what that is and then where that leads you, then you're off and running. Your heart, I believe, will pull you towards it. 844-747-2577. Okay. Uh, I thought about this, guys and, and gal. For a couple of days. What do I want to teach about in my first show of 2021? And Joe, Joe's been with me the longest. He knows this, and, and Madison does too. She'll roll her eyes as soon as I say it. I can overanalyze some stuff. I mean, I just can't. So I get in and I go, wow, geez, I could talk about this. 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 And so I had all these ideas, Joe. Big ideas about what I wanted to teach. What's the first lesson of the year? And I was all locked up. And then I got a phone call. And my best pal, Bill, talked about him many times on the show. He's like, hey, uh, it's last minute. Tomorrow the weather's going to be nice. We had some 60-degree sunny weather one day last week. And he says to me, uh, listen, I got a late tea time. We might be able to get six or seven holes in. About 3.30, you want to go out and play. I thought, well, this would be great. So I cleared it with the CEO, otherwise known as Stacy, And... So we went out and played. And I got the inspiration for what I wanted to share today on the golf course. And this is rare, folks, because rarely do I do anything on the golf course that would be called inspiring. This is about the fourth hole. Uh, I hit a great drive, Joe, on a par five. And as we all know, par fives, if you don't into golf, par five's a long hole. You've got to have a good drive to have a shot. So I blasted a drive. I'm in position A, middle of the fairway, Joe. So I get out my fairway medal, and I'm going, okay, if I can just put this down there about 200 yards, 215, be in great position. And I did what I do many times. I really tried to cook it, you know, because you see all that green out there, and I'm in the middle of fairway. I'm, I'm feeling the juice of a great drive. And so I overswing. I try to do too much. There's a lot of teaching in this, folks. And I – and I – come over the top a little bit, and it goes, but it's got a hook on it. Now, I'm on the right side of the fairway, but it starts to hook left, Joe, and I'm watching. I'm like, oh, don't go in the junk because there's some tall grass on the left side of the cart path. So then I'm watching it, and it's going over there. I'm like, ah, don't do that, and it hits hard. I'm like, slow down, slow down, slow down. Well, it jumps over, but it, it's kind of slowing down, and I see exactly where it goes in. And sometimes you don't see where it goes in. And it's in, the, it's in the stuff, but the question is, how hot was it going in? And I see a tree, and I mark it, and I go, crud. I got a chance to do well in this hole. I got to find that ball. Because I'm far enough down that if I just can find the ball and hit it out in the fairway, you know, I, I have a chance for par. All right. That's the setup. So I get down there. I see where the ball goes in. And the good news is, Joe, if it's where I think it is, somewhere in this area, I can hack out. I'm not blocked by trees, but it's 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 in about seven eight yards off the off the path. In the rough. In the no, it's in the it's in the taller stuff. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, you know, like uh, tree branches and you know the uh, the mulch and you know the stuff that leaves and stuff like that. All right, so here's the point. I start walking back to where I think it is, and I see it. Instantly get excited. I go, okay. I I look. I go, okay. I can get this ball out. 
So I immediately go back to the cart, get the pitching wedge that I'm going to use to knock it out, and I start going back towards the ball. Now, Joe, the only thing I'm focused on is that ball. All right? And and so I start walking towards that ball, and all of a sudden I feel some tugs at my pants. I look down, and I am like walking through a serious briar patch. And it's like, whoa, to the point where I stopped. Like, I don't want to rip my pants. You know, it was like it was like one of those deals. And I see my ball, two, I'm just almost to the ball, two, three feet away. And I go, so I back up a little bit. And then I step on top of the briars to get to the ball. I hit the ball out, ended up getting a bogey. It wasn't, wasn't a bad hole. Here's the reason for the story. I realized that day later, and after it hit me, what I wanted to talk about. That little story there teaches us this idea of what we need to overlook. There's real wisdom and maturity when you're walking on purpose, and I was walking towards my golf ball. At that moment, my singular purpose was to get to that ball and hit it out because I was trying to keep the hole alive. But in doing so, I did not look down and see the briars. And I'm glad I didn't. Because if I look at that and I go, Oh, there's all those briars over there. I don't want to get the ball. No, I want to get the ball. So I was overlooking, not on purpose, but I was just so intent on focusing on the ball that when I looked down and I saw the briars, I went, okay, we have a problem here. I'm still going to get the ball. I'm going to decide to overlook the briars. I'm going to back up, re-step, step over the briars, get to the ball, hit the ball. Here's the analogy. Every day in your life, we choose to overlook things. As parents, sometimes we choose to overlook things with our kids. We go, you know what? I'm not going to fight with my kids over this. I'm not going to punish this. Maybe I'm going to teach them something. Every day we are in life and maybe somebody's rude to us in traffic or somebody's rude to us in person and we choose to overlook. You know what? I'm not going to fight with them. I'm not, I'm not going to get into it. I'm going to overlook that. Every day in life we encounter maybe a coworker or something or, or, or somebody who feels like it's a slight. We go, you know what? I'm going to overlook it, I'm going to have a good attitude, and I'm going to keep pressing on. The wisdom in knowing what to overlook is the gold. Let's put it this way. Will this thing that you are considering allowing you, allowing to upset you or to distract you, will it matter five years from now? Think about that. Will it matter 10 years from now? 20, 30? On this journey to live and work on purpose, there will be countless distractions and nuisances and slights. And the wisdom to keep focused on the ball, the golf ball, the main thing, the journey, the ladder, the Mount Everest for you. You choose the analogy. For me, it was the golf ball. I was so focused on the golf ball that I just overlooked the briars to the point that when I was, when the, when the briars actually said, Hey, pay attention, Coleman. And by the way, they'll do that to you. you I just went, no, nah, it's all good. I'm already in the briars. I'm going to make sure I don't rip my pants, but I'm going to figure a way to step through and over the briars, hit the ball, keep moving forward. That's the idea. You, we overlook stuff all the time. We just kind of go, ah, but then certain things we don't overlook. And I'm telling you, that the game-changing lesson that I'm trying to share with you is that there are a lot of things in life that do not matter. They're just briars. They're not going to hurt you that bad. You can overcome them, step through them, smack them out of the way with the golf club, and keep on moving. Overlook them. Don't let them distract you. Don't let them hold you back. I'm telling you, wisdom and maturity comes when we decide this I can overlook. I'm going to look right over it and keep going. But those who are immature, those who do not have wisdom, will allow the slightest of distractions to hold them back. Don't you do it. You are too important in the work you have to do in front of you. is so important that the beauty of overlooking is freedom. It's great freedom. Well, 
That music means my time is almost up. But before I let you go, I want you to know that you matter and you do have what it takes. Thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, this is The Ken Coleman Show. Press on. Press on.